Today, Nvidia announced their next generation of gaming GPUs, which are set to launch very, very soon. They're kicking things off with three models, the RTX 3090, the 3080, and the 3070. There's a lot to discuss here, including the new cooler design, the specs, and the expected performance increase. This generation is also an opportunity for Nvidia to develop and improve their ray tracing hardware compared to the RTX 20 series, and that is definitely something that they have doubled down on with Ampere. So lots of stuff to talk about here, let's take a look. Before we jump right into the specs of these three new GPUs that Nvidia announced, let's take a quick look at what Nvidia have done with this new GPU architecture. Firstly, it's a new 8 nanometer manufacturing process from Samsung, allowing them to stack up to 28 billion transistors into a single GPU. As a reference, that's around 10 billion more than the Titan RTX from last generation, which used a 12 nanometer process. They are also focusing heavily on improved ray tracing and AI performance, and both the RTX 3080 and 3090 will use GDDR6X memory. Nvidia also mentioned that Ampere does two shader calculations per clock as opposed to one, claiming a massive 2.7 times improvement in shader performance, but I found it interesting that this is something that they didn't expand on, as it seems like a pretty important point. These Ampere GPUs are supposedly beefed up quite a bit in terms of the RTX processing hardware that's underneath them as well, as these are technically the second second generation RTX GPUs, it gives Nvidia a big opportunity to improve on the RTX implementation that we had with the 20 series, which honestly was not implemented too well. Nvidia claim Ampere will get 1.7 times the ray tracing performance compared to Turing, and 2.7 times the tensor core performance for things like DLSS. Putting all of this together, supposedly the new Ampere architecture has almost twice the performance per watt as the previous generation Turing GPUs. Keep in mind though, this was likely tested with ray tracing and DLSS enabled as the choice of game tested here, Control, is an RTX supported title. So probably don't expect two times the performance per watt in non-RTX titles, but we'll just have to wait and see. That continues into our next chart where they show the relative performance to Turing in RTX supported titles again. And this chart is likely comparing something like an RTX 2080 to the RTX 3080. So definitely some big performance gains for the world of ray tracing and DLSS, but the performance gains in non-RTX titles is yet to be seen. And to be honest, that's what most of us play. So here are the three GPUs that will be released very shortly. And as is fairly typical for most GPU launches, we're starting towards the top of the stack. The RTX 3090 is set to launch at $1,499 US, whereas the RTX 3080 and 3070 land at the same pricing as the previous gen 2080 and 2070, 699 and 499 respectively. So it's really good to see that there hasn't been a price increase for those two cards at least. The RTX 3090 on the other hand really stands out and I think it's pretty interesting to see the reintroduction of a 90 tier card as opposed to something like a 3080 Ti. The last time that we saw this tier was with the GTX 690 back in 2012 before this was eventually replaced with the GTX Titan tier of GPUs. What was really interesting to see in the presentation was Nvidia refer to the RTX 3080 as the new flagship and not the RTX 3090. Instead, they kind of referred to the RTX 3090 as this monster that they created for those that need an absurd amount of GPU processing power and memory speeds and capacity. At the end of the day, it is all naming and the GPUs are what they are for what kind of pricing they come in anyway but the specs that they are pumping into the RTX 3090 definitely respect that type of naming. Firstly, Ampere has an enormous jump in CUDA core count compared to Turing, although it might not be an exact one-to-one -one comparison, this is the main benefit of moving to a smaller manufacturing process, being able to squeeze more transistors into a single processor. Both the RTX 3080 and 3090 will use GDDR6X memory, however the 3090 has a significantly higher bus width, which should result in a significantly higher bandwidth as well. The RTX 3070 on the other hand will use 8GB of GDDR6. 
Boost clocks are fairly typical on paper from what we've seen previously at around 1700 MHz, but it'll be interesting to see what the real world boost clocks will land at, especially with much beefier coolers. The RTX 3080 not only gets faster memory from the 2080 of last generation, but it also gets an extra two gigabytes, which is definitely a welcome update. There's no holding back with the RTX 3090 though, that'll get 24 gigabytes of VRAM, making this totally suitable for a high-end workstation GPU as well. The 3090 and 3080 supposedly both pull well above 300 watts as well and that explains the much beefier cooler design which we'll take a look at in just a minute. All three of these Founders Edition cards will use a new 12-pin connector which is designed to carry more power per the amount of space that it takes up on the PCB. It's uncertain which graphics card brands will also jump on board and adopt this connector if any, I certainly haven't seen any so far. Most of them seem to be sticking with a dual or triple 8-pin PCIe connector. Now let's talk about that new cooling design on these Founders Edition cards. And I'll be honest, when I first saw this design leaked a couple of months ago, I thought that there is no way that Nvidia are making this. It's just so far from what we've seen previously. And honestly, I didn't think it was real, but it is. All three cards will use a slightly different cooler in terms of sizing, but they're all an open air cooler design with a mostly exposed heatsink, and that also plays into its own visual design. The coolers will use two fans, one positioned as intake at the bottom left, which exhausts hot air directly out of the case near the rear IO, kind of like a blower card, and the other fan as exhaust at the top, which is designed to direct hot air towards the exhaust fans in your case. This is a very unique and very interesting thermal design that seems mostly concerned with getting the hot air from the graphics card out of your case in the best way possible. Of course, having a top exhaust fan on the graphics card where the backplate would usually be means that this thermal design is not going to play very nicely with sandwich layout cases like the DNA4 SFX or Ghost S1. There, the top fan is just going to be blowing directly on the back of the power supply. So I'd highly recommend waiting for an alternate cooling design from brands like EVGA, MSI, etc. for a more conventional open air cooler if you have a case design like that. Another first for NVIDIA is the three slot cooler that the RTX 3090 FE will be using. The exact dimensions are 138 millimeters in height and 330 millimeters in length, so definitely a chunky GPU. It'll be really interesting to see what kind of designs and models come out from the board partners, and I think it's unlikely that we'll see many two slot RTX 3090 models out there, if at all. Most likely two and a half to three slot triple fan models will be the standard. Water block designs are also going to be super interesting to see as all three of these cards use a significantly smaller and V-shaped PCB. Release dates for these cards are fairly soon, September 17th for the RTX 3080, a week later for the 3090 and the 3070 sometime in October. I think these three models will make up the Ampere stack for around a month or two, at which point we will probably see something like an RTX 3060 announced towards the end of the year. Overall, this looks like it's a promising launch and announcement from Nvidia. I'm personally really happy that they kept the same pricing for the 3070 and 3080 as the 2070 and 2080 from the previous generation. I'm also really interested to test out this new cooler design as that's something that we do focus on a lot here on the channel. As always, you'll definitely wanna wait for the performance benchmarks and reviews before you pull the trigger on one of these GPUs. We're yet to see what the performance increase is over the 20 series in non-RTX titles. So do make sure to subscribe if you haven't already because that will be coming very soon. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next one.